Uh, great. Well, thanks so much. So my talk today is really focused on a couple of case studies from the Lake Malawi or the Lake Nyasa Rift, which sits at the southern extension of the western branch of the Great Rift. And um, perhaps most important for, for context here is Lake Malawi, of course, floods nearly the entire Rift Valley of, um, uh, in this particular area. And it allows us to carry out um, marine style geophysical studies in the basin. Um, additionally, uh, we have available to us uh, some, some results of some scientific drilling in the basin, which helps us put further constraints on the timing of deformation of active structures in this area. So my presentation today is gonna to focus on the offshore aspects uh, of this um, and perhaps complements some other presentations that we've heard from Jack Williams and colleagues um, about from the Southern part of the, the Malawi Rift. So this will be just uh, strictly, on, strictly on the offshore part. So I'd first like to present some of the offshore uh, data, some of the multi-channel seismic reflection data as well as some of the results of scientific drilling in the lake, which provides some timing constraints on active deformation. Uh, so I'll first sort of step through the rift segment variability that we observe along axis in the system, looking first at the north progressing south and comparing the different styles of inter-rift fault fabrics that we observe in the system. Um, one of the major outcomes of scientific drilling in uh, the Lake Malawi Rift was the observation there's been huge variability in hydroclimate in the Pleistocene. And so the point of this effort here is to uh, consider influences on that uh, hydroclimate variability on, on rifting, on fault behavior. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll show some examples of how we're trying to link some of these observational data from the lake proper to numerical models that we're carrying out in our group. Right, so in order to acquire geophysical data on the large lakes in uh, places like East Africa, it is unfortunately not possible to take a marine seismic survey ship, for example, and drive it up a river into, into uh, Lake Malawi or Lake Nyasa. Uh, we in fact have to essentially build our own vessels to carry out this work. And one recent uh, example of this was in the 2015 segment project that was led by Donna Shillington uh, that uh, where we, we converted the 65 meter container ship that had been uh, on the lake for some time uh, into a, a temporary seismic survey vessel. So everything was, was basically containerized. Uh, we worked, lived, um, conducted our studies in a series of shipping containers, deployed the, uh, the trailing gear in sort of unconventional ways, and then took it all apart at the end of the, at the, end of the survey. Uh, I must say that uh, for my next research leave, Sasha, I would prefer to take that in Potsdam or Berlin perhaps and, and share some thoughts with you rather than living in a shipping container on an African lake. But it was a very um, successful outcome for the segment project. Uh, we acquired about 2000 kilometers of multi-channel seismic data from the central and the northern part of the rift here. In addition, uh, we had available to us data from 27 ocean bottom seismometers that were deployed during the active source phase of the segment program. And this was really an enormous uplift to understanding the subsurface of the system. Additionally, we had approximately 3000 kilometers of legacy multi-channel data originally acquired in the 1980s and reprocessed um, recently. And then we had the results of uh, scientific drilling from two sites and those sites are in these little um, green triangles um, right situated here. So uh, perhaps the, the most important uh, outcome of the segment project that I want to highlight here are the results of the wide angle reflection and refraction work, which provided us with a completely independent three dimensional velocity model, uh, informative in various ways, but also helped us uh, in our processing of the reflection seismic data, we can actually move to full on pre stack depth migrated data uh, having those additional data to, to cross-check our velocity models from. So the data I'm presenting uh, herein are in depth, not in two-way travel time. And that's, that's a big change from previous, previous work. All right, so looking first at the North Basin, we observed that most of the extension is uh, situated on or accommodated by this major west bounding border fault system, the Livingston border fault, which extends for more than 150 kilometers really up into the area of Lungwe, in fact, and uh, must be a very deeply seated structure, of course. The, uh, we also observe a series of 
uh, synthetic intra-rift faults, which also accommodate extension uh, in the system. Uh, we observe sort of the maximum substance and thickest sediment accumulation right up against that Livingston Mountains border fault. In fact, that's the case for all of the, the rift segments that we observe within the Lake Malawi rift, that um, the, the, the greatest subsidence, the greatest syn rift uh, sediment thicknesses are observed right adjacent to the border faults. And this does have implications, uh, for instance, for hydrocarbon exploration and rifts, the distribution of source rocks and a source kitchen where you might actually mature hydrocarbons. It's really a very localized area, not necessarily extending all the way across the entire lake, for instance. Uh, in this system, we are uh, in this rift segment, we calculate from line length estimates, which I can uh, discuss offline or later, uh, approximately seven kilometers of total extension over that uh, roughly 50 kilometer width of that northern rift segment. Um, so moving to the central basin down through here, we see sort of an opposite polarity uh, half graben system. Again, the main, the maximum subsidence is adjacent to this uh, east dipping Usicia border fault system, which again defines the coastline uh, in the rift. This is the deepest part of the lake here at 700 meters dip, uh, 700 meters deep. Um, we uh, one of the main features or observations from the intra rift. Um, from, from, the, from the center of the half broadband is that there's a major and complex inter-rift high that extends for more than 120 kilometers along the spine or the axis of the central rift segment, uh, which really complicates um, the, or really helps to focus sediment delivery into a very narrow and localized part of the central basin right through here. We see uh, total extension amounts are comparable to what we observe in the North Basin, uh, roughly 6.7 kilometers total extension estimated from line, line length estimates. Um, but what we also observe in this abyssal plain here is evidence for very high sedimentation rates. And we interpret that there's been, uh, we interpret overpressure and we observe in shallow parts, some shallow parts of the section here, even basement detached deformation in this area, uh, and as well as shale diapirs that are developed in this area where there's very tightly focused uh, sedimentation. Uh, having said that, uh, the vast majority of the structures that we observe in uh, Lake Malawi, Lake Nyasa Rift are in fact basement involved, uh, directly related to uh, tectonic extension. Uh, and then shifting to the south basin here, we observe that the polarity of the system uh, reverses again. We have sort of a, an eastward dipping half drop and a west dipping border fault on the eastern coastline. Um, it's a much thinner section here, only three kilometers roughly of Sinrif section, uh, 3.7 kilometers total extension estimated, and a really um, much lower relief footwall compared to what we observe, compared to the very dramatic mountains that are observed in the central and northern segments. Uh, having said that, we still see some very uh, uh, dramatic intra-rift structures, including some with distinctive uh, lake floor displacement. And um, uh, there's further information on aspects of this in a recent publication in, in, in Geosphere. Um, so marked contrasts in the style of intra-rift deformation as we progress from north, central to the southern part uh, of, of the basin, uh, a much thinner section, and we interpret a much younger uh, sin rift and the younger rift system uh, overall in the south. So this is our conceptual model of the progression of extension rifting in Lake Malawi. We had initiation in the um, north and central basins, perhaps coeval with early Rungwe volcanism, uh, perhaps uh, potentially reactivating from a Triassic Karoo structures. And there, there may in fact be uh, Karoo uh, from a Triassic um, packages underneath the late Cenozoic rift sequences, but these are not well imaged in the multi-channel data. There's some suggestions of this from uh, the wide angle uh, data sets, but uh, we don't resolve those, unfortunately, we don't resolve those structures clearly in the multi-channel data. But the interpretation is that, you know, from mid syn rift to late syn rift time, we have a further progression of extension uh, to the southern part of the, of the system. So I just wanna make a few remarks about how we're integrating the results of scientific drilling into this work. In 2005, the Lake Malawi Scientific Drilling Project drilled with two main sites in Malawi, a site in the north that's pictured here, and then a deeper, longer, older site 
in the central part of the basin, which sampled materials as old as 1.3 million years at 380 meters uh, sub-bottom. So what we observe in this section in the north is um, quite, quite variable lithologies in the, this upper 40 meter section. We have a very high amplitude package of reflections here at the base of, of this sequence uh, that has been dated to about 75,000 years before present. And this actually represents a, this is a, this is a transgressive carbonate sand that was sampled in the drill core here. And what, we're, um, what we observe is that this, this surface or sequence boundary is basically a transgressive surface uh, where the, the, lake, uh, the lake shoreline passed by the drill site at about 75,000 years ago. So evidence for much lower lake levels prior to, um, prior to 75,000 years ago in this, in this system. Uh, so just recapping some of the major results of that, that drilling work was that in the Pleistocene, Lake Malawi had a, an extraordinarily variable hydroclimate. We can document more than 25 lake level drops that were more than 200 meters lower um, at times over the past 1.3 million years. And some of those lake level drops were more than 500 meters lower than modern. Uh, again, Lake Malawi today is 700 meters deep. So since about 65,000 years ago, we've had a relatively deep lake, stratified water column, bottom water anoxia, enriched um, bottom sediments are enriched in organic matter. But on many, over many intervals prior to 70,000 years ago, a much lower lake, the lake was only 100 to 150 meters deep, perhaps um, probably modulated by orbital precession and a semi-arid landscape um, uh, operative during, during that time. So, um, We'll come back to that in just in just a minute, uh, but we want to use the 75,000 year horizon that we can observe readily in all of our seismic pro profiles to help uh, constrain deformation, timing of deformation and slip rates in the system. So this is work of Lachlan Wright, a PhD student at Syracuse, who has generated uh, some examples of um, display displacement length profiles on four intra rift structures here. Uh, for the most part, we see generally symmetrical profiles like we might expect in the development of a normal fault. There are a couple examples of some, some asymmetry here where we interpret interaction of these inter-rift faults with, in this case of this, in the case of this northern, uh, northern structure, uh, there's interaction with the main basin border fault across a relay ramp. In case of uh, fault C illustrated here, there's probably interaction with some of these other structures in this area. So we can use this, we can use the dated surfaces from the drill cores to help constrain um, the, the rates of deformation here. And we include in these histograms data from all of the intra-rift faults in the central and the southern basins that illustrates the, um, the amount of maximum throw that we observe on any individual fault. And if we assume a 60 degree dip for those faults, we can make some um, rough estimates of slip rates, which are broadly consistent with what we know from, from geodesy in this area. This so work in progress. 30 minutes now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so in this curve, uh, in, this, in this map on the left, let's see if this should be an animation here, if I can get it to go. Yeah, we can see how Lake Malawi levels have changed dramatically over the past 150,000 years. Uh, so Lake was much smaller at times and we express this in terms of water lo loading in megapascals uh, over this particular time interval. So this is a lake level curve that we published from the drill core results much earlier. And this is work of Liang Zhu that is uh, documenting this in terms of um, uh, water loading stresses imparted on the lake floor. And to follow this up, uh, Liang has uh, been using the, the pilot modeling code to set up a, a finite element, element model to evaluate uh, Coulomb stress behavior and slip rates on border faults versus two intra-rift faults uh, in the, the system um, adjacent to it in this, in this central basin. Um, so this illustrates some of the, uh, this illustrates some of the results of that modeling work. We have on the left here, essentially a schematic map of the border fault, and we've got data from three different locations on the border fault. And similarly, we're examining one of the intra-rift faults three different locations on the intra-rift fault. And we evaluate changes in Coulomb stress on these different faults over the past 150,000 years. So remember 150,000 years ago to about 65,000 years ago, the lake was much 
was much shallower. It was only about a couple, it was only a few hundred meters of water load on the system. And then, um, and then the lake levels rose dramatically over the past 70,000 years. Uh, the curves on the right illustrate the cumulative slip variations on the border fault and on the interrift fault over that 150,000 year time interval. So the dashed lines are modeled slip with uh, a constant extension rate of three millimeters per year. And then the solid lines uh, compute the slip rates assuming three millimeter extension plus the lake load variations over the past 150,000 years. So um, clearly there's an impact. There's, there's a, we have diminished rates of fault slip as lake level increased. So the, the, the upshot here is uh, perhaps not unexpected, but quantified that lake unloading reduces the coulomb stresses and fa facilitates slip on both the interrift and the border fault structures. So this is just a first step work in progress um, that we hope to complete over the, over the coming year. Uh, so some of our planned forthcoming work um, intends to utilize, further utilize the offshore multi-channel seismic data sets integrated with the drill core results to evaluate a uh, displacement link analysis or uh, relationships uh, further back in time. And we have age dates on the sedimentary section, quantitative numbers going back to 1.3 million years. Unfortunately, the rift is much older than that. The rift is probably uh, five to eight million years in age. The Set Lake Cenozoic part of the rift is five to eight million years in age in any case. So um, we, we've got a long ways to go, but we can make some inferences about the past uh, 1.3 million years. Um, Liang Zhu and Rob Mucha are modeling coolant stresses and core pressure. Um, and eventually we'll try to make comparisons to the actual slip histories that we document uh, from the integrated multi-channel data and multi-channel and, and drill core data. Uh, April Langens and Rob Mucha are developing a fully coupled geodynamic and landscape evolution model that's also examining different lake loading scenarios that's, that's yielding some very interesting outcomes. And we're also developing or furthering our uh, diffusion-based forward models of lift fill phases architecture in, uh, in these systems. So that's all I have today. Thanks so much. Excellent. Super exciting. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Uh, there's not so much left. Uh, you have to be quick to type a Q in the chat if you want to ask it. Uh, otherwise, I know that uh, Janreto, you had a question. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I found it interesting the slip due to the loading. Uh, I mean, how does it work? Um, this slip due to loading uh, in in uh, relation to tectonic um, slip, but because sure. uh, yeah. to, you know, if you just load and unload a system that has no tectonics, would you? Actually, you would not actually make uh, a true slip. You would just reactivate, probably. Well, you know, first of all, the magnitude of the, the stresses imparted from loading versus extension are, are much less than than tectonics. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that that that's the most important point. Clearly, the, the the extensional stresses are far more important in this. But nevertheless, you know, the these initial models, at least are implying an impact from, uh, from, from the loading. Okay. So you're basically clamping and unclamping those faults, if you will, uh, as you increase or, or, or reduce the, the water volume in the system. So clearly, you know, you introduce other kinds of loads, sediment loads or volcanic loads, uh, it's gonna have, uh, you know, presumably a far greater effect as well. Something else we wanna evaluate down the road. Okay, uh, thank you. I would have a short follow-up question. If, if the plates continue moving, uh, continue diverging, which they likely do, I guess, then where does the deformation go at this plate boundary if you, if you, suppress, this, if you suppress it by a higher load due to the lake? Does it go somewhere else or does it just stay, um, does it st just stay within the elastic uh, memory of the plate? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't have a I don't have a simple answer for, for that one. Perhaps we could uh, we could carry that one offline. <laughs> that's a good point. Okay, thanks, uh, Chris. Thanks again, and then we move on to our last speaker.